Section Two of the Black Cat, Volume One, Number Eight, May eighteen ninety six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere. The Black Cat, Volume One, Number Eight, May eighteen ninety six, Section Two. A No Account Nigger by Leonard M. Prince, U.S.A. His name was Rafferty. How a coffee-colored mulatto came by it no one knew. When the batch of recruits with which he reported were distributed, L. Troop found him on its rolls. He seemed only a boy, not more than nineteen, and possessed of a boy's carelessness. From the start he was continually getting into trouble. Nothing serious, for he was not vicious, simply little things. But it is attention to little things that makes a good portion of a soldier's existence, and in this respect Rafferty was the trial of his troop commander's life. He had started as a trumpeter, but a few months later was sent back to the ranks. He's the most trifling nigger, sir, in the whole field music," explained the old band leader to the regimental adjutant the day Rafferty lost his trumpeter stripes. He can play if he wants to, but he never wants to," Nelson added, shaking his grizzled head angrily at the boy, who stood there cap in hand, the picture of injured innocence. Whenever it came his turn to act as room orderly, he seldom failed getting either himself or some other man hauled over the coals, owing to a habit he had of sweeping the dirt of the squad room under some bunk and then forgetting to remove it before the morning inspection was made. The first time he was assistant cook he made half the troop deathly sick by making their coffee in an old soup boiler that he had neglected to scour out. He was nearly mobbed in consequence. But upon hearing that he had been made sick by drinking his own coffee, the troop finally let him off. In a few months his captain heartily wished he had never heard the name of Rafferty. Nearly every morning old Jordan, the first sergeant, would report some fresh trouble that the youngster had got himself into the day before, always ending his tale of woe with the remark, He certainly, sir, is a most no-account nigger. One day it was the fact that Rafferty had planted all the onions in the company garden with their roots up that roused the sergeant's wrath. Another time it was the lad's use of emery on the inside of his carbine, as he said to get it bright, with the result that the rifling was ruined, and with it the shooting powers of his gun. The stable sergeant was about the only one who had a good word for him. "'He may be worthless,' the latter once said. But he do know how to take care of a horse, and he can ride alongside the best man in the troop." This latter fact was Captain Torrey's only consolation the following April, when L Troop went into the field. It was hard work, that scouting in New Mexico, hard alike for man and horse. Yet with all the bruises, rough riding, and scanty rations, there were no signs of discontent on any of the dusky faces that made up the rank and file. When a horse slipped and carried its rider clattering down some steep arroyo, the latter, as he emerged covered with dust and grime and oftentimes with some nasty cuts or bruises, would receive some such greeting as, "'Yo ho! You rise a horse like a doughboy. Don't you know, nigger, a horse wasn't a camel with a hump to hold on by?' This life just suited Rafferty. There was no perpetual polishing of brasses, cleaning of clothes, or blacking of boots as in barracks. To be sure, he had to keep his horse in good condition, his carbine and revolver serviceable, but these tasks he really enjoyed. Besides, his bunk didn't need to be swept under each morning, as in barracks, for here Mother Earth was his couch and his saddle his pillow. There was no cook's police with its everlasting scouring of pans and washing of dishes. Here every man carried his own things and took care of them in his own way. Each night he sat about the campfire and drank in the stories of scouts of years gone by. 
He looked on old Jordan with greater awe than ever when he heard how the latter, with twenty-five men, had defended the women and children at Fort Tularoso when Victoria and over a hundred Apaches attacked it in the absence of the troops. The Medal of Honor that he had seen the first sergeant wear on a few state occasions when the troop was paraded took on a new meaning to him when he heard the particulars of how it was won at Los Animas Cañon, where Jordan's coolness had saved the troop from destruction. Other tales he heard of how men lived and died in the old days, right after the war, when the regiment had been in Texas and Arizona. Some of them were gruesome enough, especially those of the torture that the Apaches inflicted on prisoners, and the oft-repeated remark of the stable sergeant. You been a heap better off if you fights till they kills you, for bullets don't hurt like fire, sank deep into his mind. Late one afternoon in May, when they had been over a month in the field and were heading toward Fort Wingate for repairs, two prospectors came into camp with the news of another Apache outbreak. Victoria, Nunez, or other equally reckless renegades were at their old tricks again, driving off cattle, burning houses, and killing the owners thereof. It was just their regular spring outing. They would be chased to their mountain fastness after an all-summer's campaign then surrender and go back to the reservations, only to repeat this game of hide-and-seek the next year. The great father was very patient with his Indian children, and after catching seldom punished them. Captain Tory knew all this but too well. If he could only get word to Wingate in time they might get the hostiles between two fires and thus give the band a much-needed beating. The prospectors brought word that the Indians were heading toward the big dry wash, but could be intercepted by troops from Wingate if the latter got word the next morning. Sixty miles of rough riding in ten hours, that was what it meant to get news to Wingate, with chances ten to one of the messenger being killed on the road. The troop could ill spare a man, as it was none too strong for the work now before it. Yet a dispatch must be sent and that, too, without delay. He was a raw recruit indeed who didn't know the danger this detail brought. Messengers had gone out before from the troop, and had never returned. So a hush fell on the chattering group of men when the first sergeant came up and ordered Thomas to report to the captain. A short, heavy-set man rose painfully to his feet as he heard the sergeant speak, but cheerily said, well, boys, I guess that hits me." The men eyed him in silence for a moment, each mentally reckoning his chances of getting through. One of them, slowly lifting a piece of bacon from the fire, at length drawled out, "'He ain't fit, you know, to fall that he had day foe yesterday. You'd better let me go.' And suiting his actions to his words, the speaker went to his kit and began getting it ready as if nothing more was to be said. It was Rafferty. Rafferty the careless, Rafferty the worthless, Rafferty about whom Thomas himself had once declared that he couldn't, oh God, see what the recruiting officer was thinking of when he enlisted such trash. Old Jordan shook his head doubtfully at such a proposition, saying, I'll have to see the captain fust. But Rafferty went on with his preparations and had about finished when the answer came back. It's all right. You're to report in a half hour for your orders. You're to have the pick of the horses. The youngster simply nodded and replied, I'll take my own. A half hour later, Rafferty was riding out of camp on that big raw-boned bay that, according to the boy, had blood in him, sir. In his ears were ringing the words of that old army song that the troop had started as he waved his hand in farewell. The echo still floated over the gravel and sandy wastes about him. Oh, the drums would roll upon me soul, the sam the way we go, forty miles a day on beans and hay, in the regular army, oh. But Rafferty was thinking only of the parting instructions of Captain Tory, which were, Follow our trail back to Los Animas Canyon, and then go due north till you strike the road to Wingate. Give these dispatches to the commandant there. Spare your horse all you can the first half. 
It's a good sixty miles, and you must make it tonight. Little had Rafferty besides his ammunition and dispatches. Every superfluous weight was laid aside, since each extra ounce counts as pounds before a sixty-mile ride is finished. Save when here and there some coyote set up his mocking howl, the voices of the night were silent. Unusually so it seemed to the boy as he urged his horse onward into the darkness. At first every shadow was an Apache, every hollow, every bit of cactus concealed a hostile Indian. But that wore off in time. The rising moon brought him light, and with light came courage. The night was nearly over, and the worst of his journey was over with it. Not more than ten miles of the Wingate Trail remained to be traversed. Still he jogged on, now at a sharp walk, now at a gallop, but most often at the slow trot that is the cavalryman's main reliance in putting those long western miles behind him. Already the light of another day was seen in the east, yet the sandy wastes about him looked doubly desolate in the morning twilight. Wearied by the long ride, he found himself nodding in the saddle in spite of his efforts to remain awake. Suddenly, without warning, his tired horse snorted with terror and made a quick leap to one side that would have unseated almost any other rider than Rafferty. The latter was all attention now. Unconsciously his right hand reached down and loosened the flap of the holster as he gathered his horse and peered forward into the dim light of the morning. Before he could make up his mind how to act, a low, plaintive cry came stealing across the sand from his left. As he heard it, all the stories of ghosts and hoodoos that had tormented him during the early watches of the night came back with redoubled force. It seemed as if his heart thumped louder than the kettle drums of the band at dress parade. In the shadowy light he could see the dark body of a man stretched out before him on the sand. Another glance showed him that it was that of a cavalry sergeant, still clutching his carbine in one hand and a half-filled canteen in the other. As he reined in his frightened steed for a closer look, that cry came again but this time louder, plainer than before. Then his courage came back. Willing his horse to the left, he rode slowly in the direction of the sound. Even in that dim gray light one glance was enough. Two soldiers and a boy, nine or ten years old, jumped by Indians and horses killed. The two little heaps of empty shells were silent witnesses as to how the men had stood off the savages till nightfall. Both had evidently died of their wounds during the night, one the sergeant while trying to bring water to the others. The boy was still living, though apparently wounded in the head. It took but a moment for Rafferty to dismount, replace the rough bandage that had fallen from the boy's head, and then lift the little fellow into the saddle in front of him. Holding the child in his disengaged arm, the trooper gave his tired horse the spur and again hastened down the Wingate Trail. The morning sun was beginning to fleck the tops of the foothills with bright bits of gold, as horse and rider clattered down a dry wash that told him he was nearing his journey's end. The little fellow on his arm kept moaning from time to time as he lay limp and helpless against the breast of the young cavalryman. Just as his horse was wearily climbing the farther bank, Rafferty saw three naked figures running low along the bed of the wash five hundred yards away. It needed no second look to tell even his inexperienced eyes that they were Mescalaro Apaches. With spur and word he urged his poor overladen horse onward. For a few brief moments he drew away from them. Could he keep it up half an hour, he would be in sight of Wingate. Every bit of sagebrush and greasewood that he passed seemed burned into his brain. He rode, so he thought, for hours, though the sun was barely up. He kept glancing to the rear now and then, but saw nothing more of his pursuers. He even began to flatter himself, as he galloped down the broad trail, that he had distanced them or else passed unnoticed. But only a recruit like Rafferty would have indulged in thoughts like these at such a time. 
No old campaigner against Victoria, Nunez, Geronimo, or any of their relatives would ever hope to pass an Apache unnoticed, or to distance him on a tired troop horse, even though the Indians were on foot. Nor did Rafferty think so for a moment later when, apparently from the very sagebrush, some six hundred yards from the trail, sprang three dusky forms bent on cutting him off. He plunged his spurs again and again into his horse's sides, but even horse flesh has its limits of endurance, and the poor beast failed to respond. Seeing the hopelessness of escape in that direction, Rafferty, like a hunted hare, abruptly wheeled to the right and started for the foothills. What he expected to do if he reached them he never knew. It was like a drowning man catching at a straw. The child had now become a heavy burden both to him and to his horse, but never once did the trooper falter in his course or think of saving himself at the expense of the little fellow on his arm. On, on, he plunged. Soon the wicked swish, swish of the bullets could be heard. Splat, splat, they went in the sand about him. Once it seemed as if a red-hot iron seared his ankle. His foot dropped from the stirrup, but he felt no further pain. The horse suddenly shied to one side, staggered, and fell heavily, throwing Rafferty and the child headlong among the rocks and sagebrush. Quickly as he could recover himself, he threw the child behind the dying horse, and painfully crawling forward, recovered his carbine. On came his pursuers, clad only in the breech-clout, their long black hair streaming in the wind. It took him but a moment to slip in a cartridge and open on the nearest of the Apaches. As the smoke cleared away he stared in amazement. Not a soul was in sight. A second later he dropped flat as he saw a puff of smoke come from behind a solitary piece of sage some four hundred yards away that looked too small to hide a bird, much less a human being. Rafferty immediately opened fire on that sagebrush and every other suspicious clump within range. Every now and then he would see puffs of smoke that kept coming nearer and nearer, and would hear the splat of the bullets in the carcass of the old troop horse or on the rocks back of him. And so half an hour passed. As the boy took off his belt for greater ease in firing, he saw, to his horror, that scarcely ten cartridges were left him out of his sixty. Soon these would be gone, and then— Suddenly, as if in answer to his question, the firing of the Indian ceased. He thought that they were again creeping forward, and wasted five of those precious cartridges on bits of bunch grass two hundred yards away. Then, lying flat on the ground, he listened. Was it the thumping of his own heart that he heard? No, it couldn't be. That faint but regular thud, thud, thud could come only from a troop of cavalry sweeping forward on a gallop. Soon they burst on his view over the swell of ground on his right. He tried to raise himself to his feet, but toppled over in the attempt. Again he tried, and this time, using his carbine as a crutch, was successful. Never in his short service had he seen a finer sight than that of the troops advancing, flankers and skirmishers well ahead. On they swept with a ringing cheer as they saw Rafferty stand up beside his dead horse. A moment later one of the troopers reined up before him. "'Ah, there,' he called. "'They come mighty close to catching you that time. Are you hurt?' "'Not much. Got some dispatches for the colonel, though, and I found this here boy a little way back. He's hurt some. My, if that ain't Captain Thornton's boy who we's a-looking for.' The troop commander stopped any further conversation by ordering four men to take the wounded soldier and the child back to the post as fast as horse flesh could carry them. The other troopers pressed on in pursuit of the Indians. An hour later they lifted Rafferty from the saddle before the colonel. The boy attempted a feeble salute as he handed his dispatches to that officer. "'Take that man to the surgeon at once. He's badly hurt,' said the latter as he saw the blood-splashed boot the soldier wore. The doctor, after cutting the boot away, found that the bones of the ankle had been utterly crushed. 
He shook his head, muttering, I don't see how he has lasted so long. Then, turning to the boy, he said, Rafferty, I've got to cut off your foot. It's only hanging by a thread. Never mind, doctor, said the young trooper, suddenly raising himself up in bed. Boys, he added, it's about time to open another box of hardtack and then collapsed. Two days later, after the fight at Big Dry Wash, when the troop first heard of his death, the stable sergeant glanced around and said, Well, for no account nigger, he had lots of sand. And no man said him nay. End of section 2